Okay, welcome back. Happy Monday. Today is May the 9th. Uh, we've got three days of new material. That is all three classes this week is new material coming up a week from today, Monday the 16th. That's the last day of classes for the semester. We have a review day scheduled for that day. And then our final exam is Wednesday, May 18th. It will be here before you know it. Um, the, uh, there is one more project outstanding. Uh, I will hand that out next class and it will be due at the start of the final exam. It is not a math project per se, but just an opportunity for you to reflect on the course and what you have done this semester. Um, there is uh, one last quiz that I will hand out. Uh, it'll be due on Monday. I'll hand it to you on Friday. <clears throat> and that quiz will just cover the new stuff, these three sections that we're covering this week. Uh, the topic for this week is differential equations. You might recall early in the semester, probably can find it up here. We did spend one day talking about differential equations. Uh, where is it? Here. We were just scratching the surface. Um, and, uh, and we will continue to just scratch the surface. But anyway, this week it's all about differential equations. Any questions on the calendar? Okay, so uh, here we are on the top of page 56 with our daily summary. Today we study differential equations and one method for solving them. Now I've got this, this disclaimer here, so let me pull up an article. Okay, number one, a differential equation is an equation involving is an equation involving derivatives of some unknown function. Uh, here are four differential equations in the chart. Uh, dy dt equals negative t over 2. The solution to that differential equation is a function. It's not like an x equals or a t equals. It's a formula. The formula is going to be y equals something with t's in it. y equals something with t's in it, such that when you take the derivative, let me write very informally here, uh, y equals something with lots of t's in it. When you take the derivative of y with respect to t, you will get negative t over 2. Good. We're going to solve that differential equation soon. Part b is the same idea. When you take the derivative of that equation, you're going to get negative y over 2, which means negative the original equation over 2. Big difference. Um, part c, it's more complicated. When you take the derivative of the original, you're going to get 0.02 times y, the original, minus 40,000 e to the 0.03 t. T's and y's both in the same differential equation here. And then finally, part d is a differential equation where you're taking the second derivative of the original, you're subtracting five times the first derivative of the original, you're adding six times the original, and magically getting zero. Okay, so these are all differential equations. Number three, let's solve equation a together. So looking at this equation, just going to have some kind of miracle here. We want a formula so that when you take the derivative of that formula, you get negative t over 2. What is the winner? y equals? What is it going to have in it, t to what power? It's going to have a squared because when I take its derivative, I'm trying to get that t, trying to get negative t over 2. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, what, what can you do to negative t over 2 to get our answer here? Antiderivative, right? Because then when you take the derivative of this blue thing, you'll just get negative t over 2, which is great. Now, this is only one possible answer, but we know there's many. Plus t is our family of solutions, right? Infinitely many. And then we'll choose the member of the family that satisfies the initial value or initial condition, y of 0 equals 3. So we've done this before, right? On that one day when we did differential equations way back when. We're given that y of 0 is 3, but we could very well just plug 0 in for the t. So we get negative 0 squared over 4 plus c to be determined. And that 0 disappears, so we just get c is 3. So that means that our particular solution is negative t squared over 4 plus the 3 that we just found, plus c. So in blue, family of solutions. In black, the particular solution that happens to satisfy y of 0 is 3. Questions on any of that? OK, so how come we can't just play the same game for part b? where we just say, take an antiderivative. Mm -hmm. 
this one's in terms of y. This one is saying something much more complicated. Before, it was just like find a formula whose derivative is negative t over 2. Or said another way, just find an antiderivative. But here, uh, the dy dt is supposed to be written in terms of the original formula y. So it's not a simple matter of doing, you know, like a y squared over 2 or, or something like that. We want a formula for a function whose derivative is negative the original divided by 2. Big change, like whether the variable over here is the independent variable or the dependent variable. If it's the independent variable, great, just take antiderivative. But if it's a dependent variable, we need a new technique. Okay, so down here in four, it says, what does it mean to say that y equals ce to the negative t over two? Uh, it might be hard to see, but that's a negative t over two. Can you guys tell that that's not just a fraction line? It's a, it's a, <laughs> that's a negative t over two. Make sure you see that negative in front of the vinculum. See how often we say that word now? Now that you know it, you're just aware, like, you'd be surprised. All right. Uh, so what does it mean to say it's the general solution to part B? Let's go back and verify. Uh, okay, so I don't know where it came from, but somebody is handing us this thing, and it's easy to tell whether or not it is a solution because we just have to plug it into the equation. So the equation in part B was dy dt is negative y over 2. So all we're going to do is replace both sides with the right thing. Okay, so dy dt. Well, let's take a derivative of that thing. What is the derivative of that thing? constant e to the negative, so a negative one-half c e to the two over two, right? e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And then I'm going to put an equals with the question mark, because I don't know yet. Is it equal to negative y divided by two? Negative, okay, so upstairs I'm going to put y, but instead of y, what are we putting in this case? c e to the negative t over 2, right? That's what y is. So are they equal? They are. So that means that the person somehow found a solution to that differential equation. Questions on what we did there to verify? We took a derivative, we plugged the original in, and then we just tried to see whether the equation was true or not. Igor? That's, yeah, that's what we plugged in. Yeah, the, the y is this, because that was the original thing given to us. Okay, so yes. It's a solution. Okay. Uh, number five, it says in each differential equation above, what are the independent and dependent variables? All right, so just looking at the dy dt parts, the y is the dependent variable and the t is the independent variable in every single one of these. But you can see that what role the letters played made a big difference in, in the fact that number or part A was easy to solve and part B, we don't know how to solve it. We were given a solution that worked, but we didn't come up with that, right? Not, not yet. Okay, so we can just write that down here. So um, what are we saying here? So independent uh, in all those cases was t, and dependent was y. All right, number six says find all values of r such that y equals c e to the r t is a solution to part b. Okay, so I'm going to copy part D here just so that we have it in front of us. So uh, what was the equation again? It was a second derivative, and then five times first derivative, 6y equals zero. So that was the original. And we're being handed uh, like, like the form of a potential solution, c e to some number times t. And we're going to find the number or numbers that make this differential equation work. So let's start taking derivatives, right? I see in this equation, the differential equation, I've got a y and I've got a first derivative and I've got a second derivative. So let's, let's write those guys out over here. So just copying the original y. And then we're gonna write the formula for the derivative, first derivative. OK. 
Okay, what do we get here? All right, because e to the stuff, just copy it times the derivative of the stuff. And the derivative of RT is R. And the C was just a constant multiplier, so it, it's multiply. Okay, and then we need a second derivative. So what's the second derivative? R squared, right? Just another R is going to come down by the chain rule again. So R squared C e to the R T. Um, that's just a notation thing. Uh, I, I'm with you in that it doesn't feel like it's symmetric, like top and bottom just look fundamentally different by the position of the two. If you ask me after class, I'll show you why, why we use that notation. Okay, so we've got our three pieces here and we're just gonna shove them into the differential equation and see what results. So, second derivative we said was the R squared. So we're just replacing now R squared C e to the RT minus five times first derivative, which is R C e to the RT. And then finally, plus six times C e to the RT. And we're hoping we can make this thing equal to zero. Any questions on the substitution? What can we factor out of everything? C e to the RT, so let's do that. C e to the RT times, what's left? R squared minus 5R plus 6 equal to 0. Okay, great. Now that it's factored, we can write down simpler equations. So either CE to the RT is 0 or everything in the parentheses is equal to 0. Now E to the RT is never 0, right? Exponential things never hit the x-axis. Uh, c is a constant. I guess it could be zero. This would be a really boring example if c were zero, but technically c equals zero would make this equation true. But the thing we're being asked to find out is r, so let's focus on the thing in the parentheses here. So r squared minus 5r plus 6 is zero, and yeah, a familiar looking quadratic equation. And this guy factors r minus 2, r minus 3. And then we set each of those pieces equal to 0. And we get r equals 2 and r equals 3. And so that means that y equals c e to the 2t and y equals c e to the 3t. Just changing the e to the rt to 2 and 3 our solutions to that, um, that differential equation. Any questions on that one? Uh, a course in differential equations. You'll have to wait. You, you'll, you'll, you'll figure it out in, when you take differential equations next spring. But for right now, I'm just handing it to you. But I mean, the fact is, like, we use it because it works, right? Like, like, we were looking for, I think we said something like this on, you know, like our differential equations day early in the semester, but we're looking for a, a function, like any old function, y equals, where when you take a derivative and a second derivative and you mush them together in this way, you get zero. Well, that means that there's got to be a lot of cancellation. So the function can't change very much when you take its derivatives, right? Like, if you tried, like, x cubed, and you took a derivative of that, you'll get 3x squared, but nothing in here is going to cancel with this plus 6y, this plus 6x cubed. Nothing else will have x cubes in order to cancel, right? And so no polynomial is going to work because when you take derivatives, it changes too much. So we need somebody who doesn't change very much when you take its derivative, and e to the rt is a good candidate for that. Okay, that was it on that page, right? Okay, next page, 7. Uh, 
Taylor series. I mean, I suppose that that if you did the Taylor series for e to the two t, that would that would work eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, the order of the differential equation is the order of the highest derivative it contains. This is just vocabulary. So let's go back for the four differential equations in the table. We're just going to write the order of each of them. The highest derivative. Let's start down here in the bottom right. What is the order? Two. This is a second order differential equation. What's the order on the rest of them? One. All the rest are first order. And the reason we have that vocabulary is um, that the way in which you solve a differential equation kind of depends on the order. There's different techniques for different orders of differential equations. Okay, number eight. In general, finding solutions to a differential equation is quite hard. Many of you will take an entire course on this subject, but some differential equations can be solved by separation of variables. So here's the idea. If you can take a differential equations and get all the y's with the dy on one side of the equation and all the t's with the dt on the other side of the equation, then the differential equation is said to be separable. And for such equations, we're going to integrate each side of the equations separately. Let's see how that plays out in number nine here. Well, let y of t be the size of some population, could be people, animals, money, anything. It is uh, common to model population growth by assuming the population is growing at a rate proportional to its current size. Rate proportional to its current size. So if you have lots of people, then lots of people are going to reproduce and the population will grow bigger than, I mean, like population growth today is a whole lot bigger than it was in the year 1000, right? Because there are just many more people around today. So a, a pretty reasonable assumption that leads to um, easy to solve equations. So suppose a population grows at a continuous rate of 5% of its current population. That's the proportional to its current population. First, we'll write this sentence as a differential equation, and then we'll solve. So let's give it a shot. As soon as I see growing at a particular rate, I am writing dy dt. Right? Y is the population, time is t. So dy dt is the growth rate. And it says the growth rate is 5% of its current population. What letter represents its current population is Y. So that's the translation, right? The rate of change is 5% of the current population. Okay, and now we're going to solve that differential equation. And we're going to do so by getting all the dy's, all the y's with the dy on the left-hand side and all the t's with the dt on the right-hand side. So how about we divide both sides by the y. You're welcome to put the 0.05 down there if you wish. I'm just focused on the y. And how about we multiply both sides by this dt to get it over to the other side of the equation. So the 0.05 is still there. And then times dt. It looks kind of funny. dy dt, after all, is a single symbol. It's not really a fraction, but we're treating it like it's a fraction. Like we could just multiply both sides by dt and move that dt over. Turns out to be legitimate. Everybody okay with moving that uh, first equation to the second one? And because we were able to manipulate the equation to get all the y's on the left with the dy and all the t's, which there weren't any, on the right-hand side with the dt, this equation is called separable. And now what we're going to do is put an integral sign in front of both sides of this equation, which hopefully seems reasonable, because after all, we're doing the same thing to both sides of an equation. It's like adding 7 to both sides. Legal, as long as you do the same thing. Right. And just want to point out, uh, you don't need to write this, but the fact that we could get the y's over on the left and the t's over on the right is specific to this equation. You can't just do that with any old equation. So for example, something like that. It's a pretty simple looking equation. In order to get the y's to the left-hand side and keep the t's on the right-hand side, what, what's, what's our only choice here? I guess subtract, right? I mean, like you could subtract y squared from both sides. I'm okay with that. But suppose that you ended up with this how would that strike you? Like an integral in front of a dy minus a y squared. That's no good, right? Like the 
integrals have to look like a single thing. You can't have a dy and then plus something or dy minus something. But then even more fundamental, like we, we got to separate the dt from all the y parts. And so like you could multiply both sides by dt, but there's just no way to pull these two pieces apart. And it's just simply that addition symbol that's the problem. Whereas over here, it was a 0.05y. There was no addition over there we could divide. So really the only thing we're allowed to do is multiply and divide, which is what we did in the first example. Okay, so let us take some uh, antiderivatives here. Integral of dy over y is ln of y. Yeah, so there's a couple things going on here. First of all, plus c, right? That's what the most general antiderivative is. The right-hand side is also going to have a plus c, and we're just going to shove both c's on the right-hand side. Um, the other thing is that uh, at one point we said, hey, really we should be putting absolute value around that, that y, right? ln of absolute value of y. Um, but the fact is there's going to be a c on the right-hand side that could be positive if you need it to be positive, and it could be negative if you need it to be negative. And so we're not, not gaining anything by throwing absolute value. Ultimately, it just looks sloppy to ignore it, but I'm telling you that it doesn't make any difference. So we'll just leave it out. Integral of 0.05 dt, 0.05 t, and then this is the side where we'll put the plus c, which is kind of the conglomeration of the two plus c's. Okay, so far so good. If we can, we'd really love to get the formula uh, in the form y equals as opposed to ln of y equals. So how can I translate this into a y equals? E to all that stuff, right? So take E and raise it to both sides or just use the definition of ln, we should get that. This answer is fine but um, there's a much more common way to write this and, and I'll show it to you. Uh, first thing is, do you believe that from our old exponential properties? Right, because you would keep the base and add those powers. So this is just pulling them apart. And if C is a constant, then E to the C, C is just another constant, right? And so how about we just call that thing I mean, you could call it K, but we really abuse the letter C in math class, so we're just going to call it C again. So C e to the 0.05 T. That's our solution. It's not the same C, but a constant by any other name. It looks like C. It does, and and yeah, no. Yeah, so C e to the RT, I mean, we talked about that earlier today, but more important, you guys talked about that back in your pre-calculus classes, right? What word in this problem says, hey, we should be using that C e to the RT formula is continuous, right? As soon as you saw that word continuous, you just memorized, oh, P e to the RT or C K e to the RT, something e to the RT. Well, how come? It's, it's, it's because of this. It's because we solve a differential equation and ln turns into an e. So this is why that pre-calculus formula is valid, solving this equation. Okay, so there's our... Yeah. Yeah, one over... Uh, yeah, when you do the antiderivative, the dy goes away and the dt also goes away. Well, it's not that it became t, it was... Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a 0.05 and then find an antiderivative of that. Okay, and then number 10 here, it says, suppose the uh, population size at time zero is 100. Let's find a formula that models the population size as a function of time. So just going back to our original solution, which is in that box there, um, we're given that when we plug zero in for t, we get 100. So where does 100 go, for y or for t? Is the y. So 100 equals some constant e to the 0 0.05, and then how much is t? is zero because it says time zero and so this is how we find the constant c and what is the constant c 100 right because e to the zero is one so c is 100 which means that this equation just becomes y equals 100 e to the 0 0.05 
which again jives with what you did in your pre-calc class because the thing that we called C in that black box represented what in English in pre-calc was the initial value, right? Like an, an initial something. So there it is. It comes out because you plug zero in for the T and the only thing left over is that C. So C is always the initial population here. All right, so just a little bit more vocabulary. A differential equation like uh, this one we've written uh, up here in black. So we'll highlight this guy. So a differential equation coupled with an initial condition that was this at time zero, the population is 100, is called an initial value problem. Initial value, right? It's given as the initial population is 100. And lots of abbreviations that you might see here. So instead of the phrase differential equation, you might see ODE, which stands for ordinary differential equation. And initial value problem you might see as IVP. Okay. All right. So the activities start right there. Your first two acronyms are there. Raise the flag if I can help. Yeah. You said we're going to do that. 